Stanford University. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, and thank you for allowing me to talk to you remotely. Uh, by not flying to give this talk, then directly I've saved a minimum of one and a half tons of CO2 emissions. If we account for the radiative forcing, it's near of um, high level emissions from aeroplanes, it's nearer to three tons. And if you'd been generous enough to pay for me to fly business class, it would have been six tons. Uh, and first class more like 12 tons. So assuming that you wanted to offer me a first class ticket, then by giving the talk this way, we've saved more than the annual average emissions of a member of the UK. And I think that's an important thing that we have to learn to do. So I hope another time to be there in person to share ideas with you at more length. But thank you very much for accommodating this way of doing it for today. And what I want to talk about to begin with is about the idea of scale. It seems to me that sustainability has become a topic that we love talking about, but we absolutely don't love doing anything about it. The picture at the top left there is our previous Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, and in 2007, when he realised that climate change was inescapably happening, he said that the UK would become serious about this now, and we would cut the use of carrier bags in supermarkets as a way of demonstrating our commitment to climate change mitigation. Now, making a reduction in our use of carrier bags does indeed save some carbon emissions, but unfortunately it saves a very small amount uh, because only a small fraction of plastic is used in carrier bags and we would save only a small amount of them. In fact, we worked out if we cut out all carrier bag use in the UK, we would save the equivalent of driving four miles less per year in every car. So it makes a difference, but it makes a very small difference. Um, the egg comes from an incredible recent survey of public attitudes towards the environment in the UK, where the public were asked to list the 10 activities that would have the most effect in reducing climate change in, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And their number one choice was to recycle newspapers. Uh, we love recycling newspapers in the UK when we're just about to fly to Spain for the weekend. We always put the newspapers in the bin. Uh, and their second choice for what would make a big difference was to eat more organic eggs. And that's a remarkable discovery because actually that's a different issue. That's got nothing to do with climate change at all. It's to do with animal welfare and uh, the release of um, certain types of phosphates into the soil. So the public are so confused that they are unable to tell the difference between completely different environmental issues but don't worry, the car companies are catching up and they're helping us make a big difference. And the car illustrated there was launched last year with the guarantee that the first 45,000 miles of driving would be covered by a carbon offset purchased with the car. Now, I don't know if you've looked at carbon offsets. We've tried to find any meaningful offset here and we can't find any because, of course, all the actions that are claimed were going to happen anyway. But surely, if you cared about your carbon emissions, rather than buying a five-litre, three-ton car that could do naught to 60 in four and a half seconds, you would buy a smaller, lighter car with a small engine. And the World Business Council for Sustainable Development at the bottom love sustainability as well. And in fact, they love it so much that they've got 30 indicators of sustainability and they're making great progress on 29 of them. So the fact that they're the second most emitting industry in the world of CO2 emissions, of course, is very small compared to the 29 other indicators of sustainability where they're doing very well indeed. So as a final flag of things that make almost no difference at all to uh, carbon emissions, uh, this is sadly not real, although I like it very much. Um, and if you have time to read that advert, which is from a spoof magazine, it's worth thinking about the conditions under which using this solar-powered sunbed would actually save any carbon emissions. 
So we have a disease of talking about the environment, sustainability and global warming, where we love discussing it and we're determined to take no action. And in response to that, we have become increasingly frustrated and decided uh, six or seven years ago that we would try to step back and ask the question, what really would make a big difference? And to do that, we needed a map. We needed to understand something of how the world's energy is used now to understand what could change in the future. And after a PhD's worth of effort, we came up with this map here. This is a Sankey diagram, and you're familiar with those because there are some excellent ones that have been made uh, from Stanford. Ours is different from yours, and what you can see here are lines. The thickness of the lines represents the energy value of the fuel, and you can see the fuels being transformed from sources here through, to, through generation and conversion to a final form of fuel then converted in a device into a useful form of energy, which could be motion or heat or communications or cooling down here. And then that useful energy is exchanged in what we've called a passive system, uh, a piece of equipment uh, for a final service. Now seeing this is quite helpful because we can get an idea of the scale with which we're using energy at the moment. You can see that we're using about a third of the world's energy in transport, roughly a third in industry, and roughly a third in buildings. I think that's quite well known. Um, and we can also see uh, which devices are important. Uh, heating uh, air in, in buildings is obviously very important. Furnaces are a key driver of all energy use in industry. And we can start looking for alternatives. For example, we could look at uh, could I make electric heaters more efficient? Could I switch from uh, petrol to electric powered cars? Or could I switch fuels in electricity generation? Looking at this, we've noticed that almost all efforts to change our energy supply to uh, combat global warming have been focused on the supply side. Um, down there is nuclear energy, which focus, uh, creates about 6% of the world's primary energy, and those are renewables, about 3% of the world's primary energy at the moment, nearly all of which comes from hydroelectric power, um, which has been developed over many years. So almost all policy discussions and almost all investment in technology to date has been focused around here in the hope that we're going to develop new magic supplies of energy which are going to solve the problem and take away the difficulty of emissions. But the map helps to explain why that's going to be so difficult. Um, if we assume that demand for energy is going to double by the year 2050 and that by then we want to halve our emissions, then we need to expand this uh, line here by a factor of 50. Uh, between now and the year 2050. And that's, of course, going to be extraordinarily difficult. And I think I could say with some certainty it's not going to happen. Um, if we wanted to do it with nuclear power, we would only have to expand our current nuclear fleet by a factor of 25. But actually, everybody, every country in the world that has nuclear power, currently its nuclear output is declining. Uh, and obviously public concern over the safety of nuclear power is holding that back at the moment. So even though uh, political debate and investment and innovation has been focused on the supply side, our instincts are that there's probably a bigger opportunity to make a big difference on the demand side. These technologies here, these conversion devices, engines and heaters, have already had a lot of in, uh, attention and the companies that make these devices are already motivated to do so as efficiently as possible. If you wanted to sell petrol engines to a Formula One car, why on earth wouldn't you make the, uh, the engine as efficient as possible? But what struck us is that the equipment in which we use the devices turns out to be extraordinarily inefficient. So at the moment, the fleet average car in the UK uses 35, uh, achieves 35 miles per gallon. Uh, I can't remember what the US figure is. I think you use about 35 gallons per mile from memory, but maybe I'm exaggerating a little. Um, 
But the world record, the PAC-2 car, achieved 15,000 miles per gallon. So between our fleet average and the world record, there is an enormous difference. And if we wanted to, we could make very efficient cars tomorrow. If the government legislated to say we must have 200 miles per gallon from all of our cars, we could do it immediately. And if you look on the website of Volkswagen, then they have a concept car, a two-seater sports car, which is able to meet European safety standards that does about 190 miles per gallon, um, which they have shown at motor shows already. Down here as well, in buildings, in Northern Europe, in climates similar to my own, then there are already at least 9,000 passive houses in operation, houses which use less than 10% of the energy to keep people warm of the average in the UK at present. So here we've also got very good solutions if we chose to deploy them. Um, but the big news that struck us looking at this map was that in this sector, in the industry area, Actually, we weren't sure if we had enough solutions because industry is a very hard in, uh, sector to understand. So on the next slide, I've broken down this map in a slightly different way. Those are the three end-use sectors again, the use of vehicles for transport, the use of buildings and industry, which makes buildings, transport and equipment, uh, and other goods. And you can see that of the world's energy and process-related emissions, just over a third come from industry. And that's hard to understand, but when we looked into the figures in more detail, it turns out that over a half of industrial emissions, more than a sixth of the world's total, come from making just five materials. Uh, these are stock materials, not the products made from them. And you can see how important steel and cement are they account for very nearly a half of all industrial emissions. So to look at our question, how do we create, uh, how do we halve emissions by the year 2050 while demand grows? We decided just to focus on those five materials. And in fact, I'm mainly going to focus just on steel because it's the biggest one of them. And I think it raises all of the issues that we need to think about when we think about emissions reduction in industry. And that's the bulk of what I'm going to talk about. But at the end, I'll come back to demand reduction in general and try and think about what that might mean for entrepreneurs, as uh, one of you kindly wrote to me suggesting that this would be, this is part of Entrepreneurs Week. And I'd like to see if we can have a discussion about that. So we're going to focus on steel mainly. And if I want to understand how we could halve all global emissions by the year 2050 associated with steel, I can't just look into the steel industry. I need to look also at the products which contain steel. And the size of these images is roughly in proportion to the amount of steel used. So a half of steel is used in construction, two thirds of it in buildings and a third in infrastructure. And the remaining half is split between industrial equipment, vehicles, and final goods. So uh, furniture or white goods in the home, for example. Um, and those are the main end uses of steel. So if we want to understand how to uh, reduce the emissions associated with steel, we have to look along the, the whole supply chain, but we also have to take account of how demand is likely to grow in future. And doing that is quite difficult. These graphs are a way of looking at demand to try and anticipate the future. The graph at the top left, I don't know if you can see the arrow on my mouse that I'm pointing at the graph on the top left, shows the history of production in several different countries. And what you can see there is that as countries develop, their production of steel expands rapidly. Um, and then when it reaches a peak at the point the country has become rich enough, it declines and uh, the country then gets other cheaper countries to make steel for it. That's what we've done in the UK. Our production peaked in about 1975 and since then it's roughly halved and we have steel made for us in other countries. So looking at production figures doesn't tell us anything useful about how demand will grow in the future. 
But this graph in the middle is amazing, um, coming out of a research group of our colleagues in NTNU University in Trondheim in Norway. They've had a series of projects looking at the stock of steel in use in different countries around the world. Um, that's a rather difficult number to get to because nobody records it directly, so they've done a lot of work to find it. And what the graph shows is that as a country gets wealthier, this is GDP per person per year, then the stock of steel in the country rises, but it tends towards a plateau. And it turns out that we're all happy when we have around about 10 tonnes of steel in our buildings, in our vehicles, in our um, equipment that serves our needs and so on. And once we've reached about 10 tonnes, then we then turn over our stock. And in the UK, we turn over that stock around about every 20 years, and our per capita demand is about 500 kilograms of steel per person per year. Um, I think your figures in the US for steel are similar to that. So if that's true, if it turns out that countries stabilise at about 10 tonnes per person, we can start looking at other countries. There are some developed countries, including uh, the US and the UK, around about 10 tonnes. Here's China, currently at about 3 tonnes per person, but of course developing very rapidly. And here's India, which is currently with a stock of 1 tonne per person. So if we forecast that China and India and other countries uh, develop along a similar path to our own, towards 10 tonnes, it gives us a basis for predicting how global steel demand is going to grow. And by the year 2050, roughly speaking, we can say that demand for steel will have doubled from today. The graph also makes a point about the difference between making steel from ore, primary production, and making steel from scrap, secondary production. Because steel in buildings lasts for about 40 years before the buildings are replaced, then the availability of material for recycling lags the uh, total demand. So even if we recycle very effectively, which we do because steel is magnetic and it's easy to take out of the waste stream, then uh, the, of the amount of steel we'll be able to produce from recycling by the year 2050 will be no more than half our total. Uh, we're still going to need production from ore. So the challenge I want to ask is how can we uh, meet double the demand for steel and halve the total emissions from today's level within the next 40 years? And to do that, we're going to develop a little methodology. Here's um, a map of the flow of steel through the world's economy. This is drawn rather like the energy map I showed before. The width of the line is equal to the flow of steel in megatons per year. Um, and here you can see iron ore being converted to steel in the steel industry. Here's scrap being converted. There are the rolling processes producing the stock products of the steel industry. And this spaghetti-like mess over here is downstream manufacturing and construction converting steel stock into the final goods, construction, equipment, vehicles and metal products that I mentioned earlier. So that's a, a map of the flow of steel and based on what we've just seen we can anticipate how that map will change as we move towards 2050. And on top of it I can impose a, uh, our understanding of the main processes involved in steel making. Uh, I'm sure these are familiar to you, the blast furnace that converts iron, uh, iron ore to liquid iron, the basic oxygen fur furnace that converts it to steel, casting and rolling and so on. And so what we can do in looking ahead is to ask how will these uh, processes develop and how will demand develop? And if we look ahead with one eye open, uh, using the title of our book, then we can say, could we improve these processes so much that by the year 2050 we're producing steel with only a quarter of the emissions per unit of steel? That would allow us to double our output while halving our emissions. And if that's not possible, then let's try looking ahead with both eyes open, again according to our title, and ask if we could live well with less new steel. So firstly, we'll look ahead with one eye open. And I'm not going to show any details of that, but just show the outcome of where we uh, got to. 
If we don't do anything, then if demand doubles, roughly speaking, emissions, which are at about three and a half gigatons of CO2 per year for the steel industry now, will nearly double by the year 2050. Not quite doubling, because there'll be more production from scrap by then. If we do everything that we can think of to make the process efficient, then we could make some progress. But if you think about it, the steel industry has for 150 years known that it's an intensive user of energy. So it's already focused 150 years of development effort on becoming more efficient. And actually, according to our numbers, the steel industry is the most efficient industry in the world. Um, it's within a factor of two, best practice is within a factor of two of the standard chemical exergy for extracting iron from iron ore. And really there's very little space left for becoming more efficient. Could we power the steel industry in future from renewable energy? Well, maybe, but the difficulty is that we're not able yet to power the easier applications like domestic electricity use from renewables, and it's hard to imagine us scaling up uh, renewable supply by this amount. Could we find alternative uses for heat? Well, maybe. Might we be able to create a pure stream of CO2 and capture it and bury it underground? Uh, again, maybe, although nobody has yet managed to combine those two activities of capturing and storing. But if we assume that we do some of everything and we take efficiency to its limit, roughly we can envisage a route to keep emissions at today's level without, uh, while we increase our steel output. That would be an amazing achievement. Uh, but it's not the target that we started with. It's not what you've got in law in California. It's not what we've set in law here, where we've set a requirement that we reduce our emissions to 20% uh, of 1990 levels by 2050, the same as you. So our target for today's talk is, can we halve emissions? And the importance of this forecast is simply to say, by looking only at energy efficiency and emissions efficiency, there is no chance whatsoever that we can reduce emissions to half of today's levels if demand grows as we expect. So that opened the avenue for us to say, could we do something else? Could we actually live well if we make less new metal? And we found that actually, yes, there were several other strategies that haven't had much exploration, and we could look at these. So there are six on here, using less by design, reducing the yield losses, the scrap generated in manufacturing, diverting scrap, reusing old metal rather than recycling it, keeping goods for longer, or in the end, reducing demand for services. And I've got one slide on each of those, arising from a project we've been doing for the last five years with a team of eight of us. We've had a big consortium of companies playing uh, or taking part in this work and what we've done for each of these six strategies is spend about four months on each of them. We've designed sets of case studies that we could do with our partners. Uh, we've carried them out and developed real uh, industrial data and commercial estimates of costs and so on. We've written up a draft report and showed it to our commercial partners. They've told us why we're ivory tower academics out of touch with the real world and we've updated our report to try and reflect their insights. And then out of all of that, we published our book, which came out last year. Uh, I'm mentioning the book, obviously hoping that you'll rush to Amazon uh, to buy a copy, but uh, we're so keen to share the message of it with you that we're actually giving it away for free online as well with botheyesopen.com. I'll give you the URL at the end of the talk. So what I've got now is six slides, one on each of these strategies, to try and summarise some of the learning that we came out of this process. Firstly, can we use less metal by design? Um, I can't see the roof of the building that you're in at the moment, but I'm fairly confident that the roof that's above you is being held up by a set of beams, which are a constant depth. Um, this is a constant depth beam which has a rectangular cross-section, and almost certainly the one above you looks a bit more like the cross-section here, uh, which we would call an I-section beam. Or if it's made out of concrete, it probably does look like this. And every building I've looked at um, when I've been giving this talk 
uh, this beam has had a constant depth all the way across. But every engineer in the world, after their first year, will tell you that in the middle of the room, the beam should be deeper than it is near the walls. And that's because the tendency to bend, the bending moment, is greater in the middle. So really, the beam should look a bit more like this. It should be deeper in the middle and less deep at the edges. And if you're in a steel frame building and you compare the design of a constant depth I-beam with one with variable depth like we've shown in our cartoon here, then you would save a third of the steel in the building with no loss of service, no loss of performance in the building that anybody would be able to detect and still within all of the safety codes that govern the building. So it turns out that we can use a third less metal to build the building with no loss of performance. And that's a truly amazing result, given how difficult it is to save energy or emissions, realising that we could use less metal and still deliver just the same performance was really eye-opening. So we looked at a whole series of other case studies. We looked at deep sea line pipe for transporting gas and oil under, under the sea, at components in cars, at reinforcing bars and at food cans. And in every case we found roughly the same number. If we optimise the design of the components, we could use about a third less metal than what we're using at the moment. Now there are many reasons why we're not doing that. In some cases, like with the line pipe, the loads on the pipe are actually greater during installation than during use. So we have extra material for that purpose. But the real killer, the reason why we do it, is because in countries like yours and mine, labour is expensive and material is cheap. So it's been worth us pursuing the economies of scale in producing uh, components and products that have a standard cross-section rather than optimising them, because the cost of labour in optimising them would uh, be greater than the cost or the value of the material that we saved. When we looked into that a bit further, we've been doing a set of studies with construction companies in London, and we've recently completed a study of 20 commercial buildings built in the last two or three years in central London. And we looked at the steel in the buildings and compared what was designed with what was required by the safety standards that regulate buildings in the UK. And amazingly, the building as designed weighs double what's required to meet the safety standards. And what we found is that the time of the designer, the construction engineers, or, or structural engineers, is so expensive, it's simply not worth designing the building properly. We design buildings for the area where we know the greatest load is, and then use the cut and paste facility on CAD packages to copy the design round the rest of the building because the, the additional cost of steel is less than the additional cost of the design time and maybe the logistics of managing a more optimised building. So there's a huge opportunity to use less material, therefore to save all the emissions of uh, the embodied emissions in products if we chose to design them optimally rather than to pursue a minimum economic cost based on labour. That's a good icon for where we're going to go. On the map of steel I showed earlier, I don't know if you noticed, but there were some long return loops going back from manufacturing. It turns out we generate quite a lot of scrap in production. In fact, for every person in the planet, we're currently making 200 kilograms of new steel each year, 1,500 million tonnes of steel made in 2008 for about 7,000 million uh, people in the planet. So about 200 kilograms of uh, steel per person. But a quarter of that never gets into products. And we went and looked in detail at these five products. Um, and we asked the companies whether they were in control of scrap. And they all told us, yes, we're terrifically good at managing scrap. And in our business, there's almost no losses. So we knew something funny was going on. And we arranged for two of our most charming students to start at the end of the supply chains for these products and to walk back up the supply chain, flattering all of the operators they came and praising them for their fantastic scrap management processes in order to try and get some real numbers. And what we found was that for long products like the I-beams we've just been discussing, 
we are actually quite efficient, and that's because we make them in long lengths and then just cut them to length when we need them. But for anything made out of sheet metal, car doors and drinks cans were the two we were looking at, we're extraordinarily inefficient. And the reason is twofold. One is that when we cut blanks to make sheet, we cut them out of sheets of strip steel. Um, and we cut one product at a time and then index the strip along and cut the next one. And of course, doing that, we create a lot of trimming losses, um, blanking skeletons, they call it in the industry. In this case, with the car door, you can see that we also have created a huge amount of scrap in cutting out the window. And the way the industry is configured at the moment, that window becomes scrap. There isn't any business model or technology available to allow us to cut a different part out of the material that was cut out of the window. So just blanking creates a lot of scrap. And then in the subsequent forming processes, we form a shape and then cut a great deal off. So it turns out that we're creating a half of all the material that we make to become sheet metal, gets cut off on the way to uh, becoming a product. Uh, when we looked at the aerospace industry, interestingly, they turn 90% of the metal they purchase into scrap, and aeroplanes are only a small byproduct of their operations. The real aim of all aerospace manufacturers is to convert high quality aluminium into chips into scrap and then to throw them away at the lowest possible value. It's an extraordinary business model. Um, clearly there are things we can do here and there are some technology opportunities where we could design different ways of cutting and shaping metal. If you think about the clothing and textiles industry, they've solved this problem really well by tessellating the different parts of a shirt, for example, on a roll of fabric and then laser cutting them out to optimise the placement and cutting out of components. And we've got a lot of projects in place now trying to sort this out within the industry. Could we divert scrap? If we're making so much of it, could we find other uses of it? Well, this is a limited opportunity and we've only found a few examples, but there's a rather nice story about this building. I don't know if you recognise it, but this is a stadium in the East End of London where the Queen and Mr Bean made a performance last summer. Um, and, uh, and lots of British athletes also did extremely well. I think there were some other countries represented there too. Um, the roof of this is a truss structure. Um, and because of the circular shape of the stadium, the truss was a rather complicated design and all the elements of it were individually designed. But when the Olympics was being constructed, the contracting engineers became worried that they were going to run out of time to assemble this uh, roof. Um, and at about the time they became worried about that, somebody else who was installing a new gas uh, um, well in the North Sea <coughs> excuse me, realised that they had over-ordered their gas pipe. So uh, an enterprising young engineer saw these lorries of unused, unwanted gas pipes being driven from the North Sea for recycling and diverted them onto the Olympics website. And the Olympic main stadium was then redesigned and the entire stadium was made out of unwanted gas pipes and not the pristine tailor-made structure that was originally designed. So it's a nice story, but unfortunately there aren't so many opportunities for doing that. However, there are an awful lot of opportunities for reusing scrap steel, particularly in construction. <coughs> Excuse me again, my uh, students have been building up a winter cold that they finally passed to me over the weekend. I'm not feeling fully well at the moment. In the UK, in the 1970s, we made a rapid shift in our commercial buildings from building with concrete to building with steel frames. And the blue curve up at the top right is the history of the use of the structural sections in building buildings in the UK. I think in the US you had a similar transformation. Um, and you have a lot of single-storey steel-framed buildings because you have more land than we do. You're able to spread out more. These buildings typically last for about 40 years. So we know that in the UK we're about to see a surge of supply of unwanted steel-framed buildings. And at the moment when they reach the end of life, they're taken down by this precision scientific instrument here. 
uh, which knocks them to the ground and tears them up. Um, and if you ask the industry, they'll all tell you that this is terrific because the steel is being sent for recycling and that's green, so that's a good thing. But actually, there's nothing wrong with the steel at the moment that we take it down. What we could do is to unbolt it a bit more carefully, as has been done here, and then we could refurbish the steel and build a new building. This is one that's been built entirely out of old steel. So we found the whole supply chain for reused steel in construction already exists in the UK. And when we looked at the money involved, the uh, top curve there is the price of new steel sections in the UK over a three-year period. And the orange line is the price of scrap. So the gap between those is the margin, which could cover the green area is our estimate of the additional costs of deconstruction as opposed to demolition. And the purple area is the costs of recertifying old steel. So the blue area looks to us like a profit opportunity that we could be taking. Now there are some issues around that, mainly to do with the way that we sign construction contracts at the moment. So we're starting to try and develop that and to develop a market for reused steel in the UK and we're beginning to feel there's some momentum for bringing that about. What about longer life products? Um, in the UK, we love history. It's one of our um, best features that we're an old country with lots of history. Um, so we like to make a lot of that. This is the first iron bridge in the world. It uh, links us, um, it, it's on the border between England and Wales. Uh, these are a series of products that failed to achieve heritage status. And this is a famous bridge that connects one bit of Scotland to another. If we want to keep old products going, we know how to do that. And our museums are full of old metal or material products that we've kept going. So it turns out that in nearly every case, the reason that we replace old goods is not because they've degraded. In our understanding, it's really only infrastructure that we replace because it's broken, rail track or bridges in particular. Mainly we replace goods either because our needs have changed as users, they're unsuitable for our current use. So our example here was for a, a young couple with a sports car might need to change it if they had a baby or if the product is now inferior relative to what's on the market in, uh, right now. And of course, people who like buying washing machines like to have as many buttons and lights on the front of the washing machine as possible. And your 10-year-old washing machine might not have as many digital displays as one on the market today. So you might be tempted to replace it. Thinking about that, we discovered that a nice icon of long life products occurs in the world of metal rolling. Uh, nearly every rolling mill ever built is still operating today, even if they're 100 years old. And that's because the big chunk of metal, the frames and the big backup rolls, don't really wear out and there's not been any significant technology development. The Young's modulus of steel today is the same as the Young's modulus a hundred years ago. So the share of steel in the product is dominated by a few components, but the cost share is dominated by some systems on the surface of the rolling mill, particularly the control systems, which have a high value and are easy to replace and upgrade. So rolling mills are a great example of a product that by accident has been designed so that the embodied energy lasts for a very long time, while the value added can be replaced and renewed quite frequently. And although we don't have an answer there, we can see that there's a model of design that we could try and share and bring about more, um, more widely to try and uh, support longer life products. I'm not going to talk too much about this, but uh, there are many studies now, I'm sure you've come across them, showing that as countries get wealthier, eventually the population within them don't continue to show the same uh, increase in well-being. It seems that beyond some threshold, uh, we don't get any happier as we get richer. And I think we probably in our countries, rich countries, we know that. Um, if we did a ranking of our friends by happiness and well-being, it wouldn't be the same as the ranking of their income. 
So everything else I've talked about has been about using less material to deliver the same service. But actually, we can, if we really cared about carbon emissions as our number one driver, we could envisage living with less service and probably still living quite well as well. I'm not going to say any more about that, because what we've done now is we've developed six new strategies that we could use to try to reduce emissions from industry. And we've uh, tried to make use of those by creating a graphic mixing desk of sustainability. So our concept here is that for each of the products in the catalogue I showed you at the beginning, we've set up a slider where at the bottom of the slider is the amount of, uh, the way we're doing things now, in this case the amount of metal in construction per square metre, and the top end of the slider is the physical limit of the, li the least amount we could imagine getting to. We've done that for all our strategies for all of our products, and then we've played with our mixing desk to say, could we now, in addition to the one eye open strategies we saw before, could we move those sliders and bring about the scale of change that we wanted to deliver double the service while we halve emissions? And of course, you won't be surprised to realize that for steel, if we move all of our sliders to about halfway up their maximum value, then we can indeed bring emissions down to the target level. Now, this is a forecast, and you know that all forecasts are wrong, uh, and I can't defend this with any degree of precision. But I think what we can say from this is that pursuing energy efficiency within the existing process definitely won't lead us to achieve the degree of reduction that we've set into law. But there are a whole set of other strategies, material efficiency, using less material, which are viable, real opportunities that would have a very big impact on industrial emissions, and we simply haven't given them enough attention. So that's what we're now going to spend time trying to bring about. Um, and the government in the UK announced in November that it would fund five national centres for energy demand reduction, and in the uh, ensuing scrap uh, I uh, won one of the magic lottery tickets, so we'll be leading a national centre for en industrial energy and material demand reduction uh, for the next five years, trying to bring about in practice some of the strategies that I've described here rather as targets. I wanted to end just with two or three slides about implementation. Um, the first one, I just want to look at the fridge here. Fridges in the UK last for an average of about 10 years. Um, they break for a ridiculous reason, that the bearings in the motor that drive the compressor break. And because we can't repair the motor, then we have to throw away all 70 kilograms of the fridge. So if a household in the UK has um, about three people in it, and uh, the fridge is about £400, um, then we're spending about £13 per person per year on the ownership of a fridge. And if I, instead of replacing the fridge every 10 years, every three years invited somebody in to come and spend a, an hour servicing my fridge, roughly speaking, economically, that works out. So I could potentially envisage a business model where I substitute the labour of servicing and maintenance for the labour of production, and it looks as if the business model roughly stacks up in that case. Surprisingly, the steel industry is interested in everything I've said. Um, when I first gave a talk about this work to some people in the steel industry a year ago, I assumed that it was like standing in front of a group of hungry lions with a raw steak on my head. Um, but to my surprise, I left the room alive, and it turns out the steel industry is in an absolutely miserable position because they're trading a global commodity uh, with, with excess global capacity. There's more steel capacity in the world than we need. So talking about adding more value to less steel actually is attractive to them. And talking around the six strategies I've uh, discussed in the talk, then actually we can envisage new business models. At the moment, the steel industry sells a commodity product, a, a, an intermediate good of stock steel, if they integrated one stage downstream and became component suppliers, 
actually there's a lot of opportunities to capture a lot more value with less metal. Um, I gave the uh, illustrations of yield losses and to try and provoke a little bit of response on this. Uh, with my daughter, uh, we've demonstrated here the opportunity to make cake more efficiently. I don't know if you've ever made uh, pies out of pastry. I think you call it um, crusting in the US. Is it uh, um, pastry that, w that we would make tarts from? Normally we cut circles from them and having cut the circles out, you're left with a lot of pastry left over. So while my wife was out one evening, we took a hammer to the uh, family pastry cutter and converted it into a hexagon and demonstrated that you can cut hexagonal cakes perfectly out of a sheet of pastry. And in completely independent trials in my research lab, we discovered that UK PhD students greatly prefer hexagonal cake to circular cake. Um, so, more seriously, uh, we could uh, be much more efficient about the way that we generate scrap. We could generate less. There are some opportunities for diverting scrap. I think there's a big opportunity for the steel industry to take uh, its own second-hand supply chain back inside, just as the car companies have done. They own their own second-hand supply chain. And maybe there are some interesting business models about leasing and maintaining materials over a longer period. So finally, as we're in California, um, I wanted to think a little bit, sorry, that slide's a little bit small, um, about entrepreneurship. Um, and I think the world of entrepreneurship and demand reduction is wide open, and we simply haven't started working out how to think about it. In the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, where we're working towards the next assessment report, the macroeconomists, when they're assessing mitigation options, ask us to supply a list of the technical potential of all abatement options and the cost. And by cost, they mean the investment cost. And it turns out the whole policy dialogue around low carbon futures assumes that those two numbers exist. And that's because the macroeconomists are thinking about the substitution of one energy supply technology for another, the installation of renewables. But with demand reduction, actually, it's not at all clear that we need investment in the same way. We're talking about an alternative way of doing things, and the te technical potential is to a large extent unlimited, because we all know that if we were really pushed, we could drive very much less, or we could have many more people in the car. So there's a real research opportunity to engage in a much bigger dialogue about demand reduction. But for provocation in the discussion I hope we're about to have, um, here are three ideas. Um, energy service companies have had a bit of press here, and I guess over there as well, where there's an idea of having a new form of utility company that buys the utility of energy, but delivers the utility of warmth in a building. So the energy service company is motivated to become efficient in delivering warmth, because their profit increases if they buy less electricity or energy. And we've seen just a few hints of material service com companies. So in this case, this is a building with a very high value aluminium roof. And because aluminium is so much more expensive than steel, there are companies that will lease aluminium building companies. I've talked about the fridge and the opportunity to substitute labour for materials. And the best example of that I know is not so far from you, down the road in LA, where um, the company FixYourOwnPrinter.com has an absolutely brilliant business model, where online they create videos to show you how to repair your own printer, and they'll post you the components you need. If you haven't seen it, this is a fantastic business model, which I've used and tingled with pleasure as I fixed a small error with the printer that I would otherwise have had to replace. But I think even behind that, there's a bigger issue. That in either of these cases, what we're trying to do is to substitute labour for materials. And the difficulty of that is that we're keeping the same amount of money going around the economy. So what we're hoping is that in transferring our payments from labour to materials, the people who receive the income for labour are themselves going to make low-carbon choices in their purchasing. 
But we can't guarantee that. And if the person running fixyourownprinter.com really dreams of having his own jet and flying, then maybe this has been a carbon negative strategy to support that hope. So something that as yet I've seen no dialogue about is the question about whether we can rethink entrepreneurship measured in time rather than money. I've noticed that if you ask everybody what they would do if they were given an extra day off, if there was a new public holiday announced next week, I've not yet met anybody who would say, ah, terrific, there's a public holiday, I'm going to take on some extra work and earn some more money. What people talk about is their leisure. And I think we've somehow forgotten to value leisure properly. And it may be that the real key to unlocking energy demand reduction is to build a new form of entrepreneurship around our own time, to value our leisure time more, to spend more time enjoying leisure, and therefore to worry less about growth measured by high value added, and to measure more our growth related to the value and quality of our time. Of course, that's a highly provocative way to end a talk which has otherwise been, um, I hope, rooted in what's commercially credible for now. So to sign off, the book that um, we've uh, recently published, Sustainable Materials with Both Eyes Open, can be uh, bought for very, very low uh, and excellent value on Amazon, uh, but also read online for free at um, www.withbotheyesopen.com. And uh, to try and promote it, we've uh, released the world's first ever CD of pop songs about a low-carbon industrial future. You can also hear some of those on the website. And I am very grateful to you for listening and would be delighted to have a discussion. Thanks very much. Dr. Alwood, can you hear me now? I can hear you very well, thank you. Excellent. So we are at the end of the official time for the seminar, so I want to give anyone that needs to leave the opportunity to go out. Uh, but if a couple of people are interested in staying, we'd love to have at least two, three questions and have a short discussion. So I'm, I'm going to take uh, questions from the audience students first or, or threads on this discussion. And feel free to raise your hand and I'll, I'll come and bring the mic to you. Hi. Uh, yes, I'm wondering Hi. if you took the carbon footprint clear back to, say, point of raw extraction of the materials in the steel, if anybody's looked at that. Uh, I'm sorry, could you say that again? Yes. I'm wondering if you looked, have looked at or considered looking at taking the materials that are in the steel back to the point of raw extraction in terms of its carbon footprint. Uh, the mining component is a relatively small energy user. Uh, the dominant energy is the reaction that occurs in the blast furnace. Is that what you're, you're meaning? Is, is energy in mining significant? Yes, that was the question. Okay, and the answer is no it isn't. Uh, mining is small compared to the, uh, the chemical reaction. Uh, partly, of course, because the chemistry occurs at 1,500 degrees Celsius, so you have to jet use a lot of heat to get there. Okay, well, I have a question for you, Dr. Alwood. On the topic of entrepreneurship and the steel industry potentially reusing these materials, um, I'm wondering if, if you thought at all, it's something I've been thinking about a little bit, the companies kind of, the idea is that they own the full cycle of this product. So, like, when it's sold initially to make a building and then because they still own it or because they can derive value from it, they'll recycle it and use it again. Um, have you had any thoughts or conversations about business models that involve the original producer continuing to own the steel in some way? Like how do we incentivize them to want to wanna recycle it? Yeah. It's just a question of the relative value of the material. So if you talk to a platinum company, uh, then they do retain the platinum on their balance sheet and in effect you rent it from them. So I think glass manufacturers use platinum as the nozzles of their extrusion processes. 
and they don't own it. They, they rent the nozzle um, because, of course, the material is so valuable. So we have found an example of that occurring in aluminium, as I mentioned, with aluminium building comp components. For the steel industry, it is harder to envisage now because the asset would sit on their balance sheet for 40 years before they saw it again, and the leasing value would therefore be relatively low. Um, but in due course, maybe uh, particularly if we had higher value components that were uh, building frame components, maybe we could bring it about. Um, there are um, marquees or temporary structures that are used in exhibitions or uh, in big events like motor racing events are already owned by the company that erects them. They're not sold to the venue, they're leased. So in a sense what we're doing is trying to envisage that leasing model uh, moving uh, to more commercial, more conventional commercial buildings. So one of the people we've got our eyes on at the moment is the largest supermarket chain in the UK. Supermarkets typically last for 20 years before they're replaced. And it's almost possible that they might uh, start thinking of supermarkets as a kit of parts that they keep on their balance sheet rather than purchase and then discard. Dr. Alwood, I'm a graduate student here and I feel like the people in my lab are the only ones in the world who analyze systems based on exergy, so I was really excited to hear you mention that. Uh, do you have any idea, you said something about the chemical exergy comes within a factor of two for the steel industry, and I was just wondering if you could expand on that, if you have any idea like what the exergy efficiencies of steel plants are. Uh, I, um, I can give you a paper with a lot more detail and of course I know the work of your group and I'm really delighted to know it's there. Um, but the uh, optimal performance, uh, I can't, I, I'm too old to remember the numbers and I apologise for that. But if you assume that the chemical reaction has to occur at high temperature, so if you allow the um, exergy value of heating, then the current best practice is better than two times the absolute minimum of extracting iron ore from hematite. Um, so I think it's the, it's the standard chemical exergy calculation, isn't it? You probably know a lot better than I do, but drop me an email and I can send you the reference if that's useful. We'll have one last question. Uh, thanks very much for a very interesting talk. Um, since there's a lot of electronics produced around here, a question that uh, occurred to me was there's a, a growing use of minor metals and, and your study starts with the um, um, current balance, uh, current amounts of CO2 being produced by the major metals. Do you see any shift in the amount of metals, like minor metals, rare earths, so forth, that are being produced that are going to change? Uh, and they go into uh, products which maybe, like cell phones, have 40 or so metals and are very hard to recover, whereas the uh, steel and the um, aluminium or aluminium are easy to recover in the large amounts. Do you see any change happening because of these new products? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think um, the those minority uh, or strategic metals, as I think they're known, uh, are, I doubt, ever going to be significant relative to steel, just because the volumes of steel are so unimaginably high. Um, but it's pretty clear that the energy intensity of extracting the strategic metals is likely to go up. Uh, so um, we are using up some of the easier to extract ore deposits uh, and therefore the amount of energy required to extract what we want is going up. And actually that's already begun to happen with aluminium since 2008 the reported energy intensity of extracting alumina from bauxite has just begun to creep upwards because the quality of the bauxite being mined has declined. Um, I, I think the issue is probably a different one. Uh, it seems to us that the strategic metals are very vulnerable to rapid changes in demand where the mining industry is rather slow to adjust to demand changes. Uh, because, of course, the price needs to be high for a decent uh, time before the mining industry has the confidence to invest in a new mine. So we haven't really found any examples where we're in serious danger of running out of anything. It's more that in the short term, while our supply driven by uh, 
the behaviour of all your um, near neighbours in Silicon Valley and others uh, in uh, creating new interest in materials, metals that have previously been only minority uh, uh, use, uh, that have only been used in small volumes. It creates a temporary uh, excess of demand, but as far as we can tell, there's the capability of creating more supply once the mining industry focuses on it. Professor Allwood, one more question for you. I'm a PhD student here. Uh, you mentioned the opportunities of reusing the steel without remelting, and to me it sounds more challenging to do so for the second largest material that was in your um, circle diagram toward the beginning, cement. Are there any opportunities, um, or what are the current state of the arts for reusing this second most abundant material that's in your construction and other flows? Um, are there possibilities of not fully demolishing cement, and what are some of the either reuse or recycling opportunities in this sector? Thank you, that's a great question. The um, first thing about cement is that there is no recycling route. Uh, the industry, of course, disguises that, and it likes to talk about crushed concrete as a recycled material, but it isn't. Crushed concrete is potentially a substitute for stone, uh, but the sizes of crushed concrete, the particle sizes vary over a very wide range. And if you make new concrete from cement and crushed old concrete, you need more cement than if you made it from cement and stone. Uh, there's no chemical route to recycling without an enormous energy investment. So reuse or life extension, lightweight design and reuse are the only strategies available to concrete. And as yet, reuse has had no attention at all. The, the thing uh, that's giving us hope is that the construction industry in the UK is having a big push towards more off-site fabrication. So the big new development in construction here is a move towards prefabrication, where parts are manufactured in factories with precision uh, manufactured uh, dyes and moulds so that the components are made to a very high precision. Um, so that they can then be erected very rapidly on site. Now at the moment when that's done, they're still joined with more concrete on the site, but we are working with one of the bigger contractors in the UK, at looking at mechanical joints bet between these prefabricated components. Because if we could make a reversible joint, in other words to have a rule of no wet work on the site, then at the end of life we could unjoint the components and treat them like stone masonry, which could then be used another time. So valuable old stone is always reused in European buildings because we like the heritage of our old components. And I think that's the big hope for concrete in the future, is to think of concrete as forming a, a kit of Lego blocks that we then uh, unjoin and reconfigure. Would, uh, we wish you could be here for the reception, but uh, we have uh, much respect for your full commitment to sustainability, and thank you for the illuminating talk. Thank you very much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.